So in part one, I showed you how to configure the ISE project to actually add the debug cores using either the um, sort of automated insertion or the manual tool insertion. So now I'm going to show you how to actually connect the chip whisper analyzer. So you program it using the, um, the sort of normal way. So I'm just going to program the the device. So this is using the LX9 board. Um, it has full built-in tool, uh, USB JTAG tool. So just program it with impact. Um, so again, this was the, the target. And then you start the analyzer. Um, so this is the ChipScope Pro Analyzer I'm using. Just move this over a bit. Here. Oh. Ignore that. There we go. Um, and so I'll just connect to the Digilent USB chain. Um, and here the device will pop up and it should detect the, uh, the device. So in this case, there's two, there's a virtual IO device as well as the ILA. You may not have the VIO device if you didn't insert it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is give some, these ports, these nice names. So I said before, you could just have one trigger, one port with everything on it. The advantage of the separate trigger units is it makes it easier to find signals. So for example, this signal I know is RX ready. Um, and if you don't remember, you can go back to the source code and look, for example, so bit eight was RX ready of trig zero. Of trig one, bit eight is TX start. So I'll just go ahead and give that a name, TX start. Um, for this port, that whole port is actually the counter. Um, and this one has two bits. One of them is the physical data wire uh, the RX and one's the physical data wire, the TX. So this one's the TX and this one's the RX. Um, all right, so that's looking good. So we want to actually plot these in a similar nice way. When you look at the graph, it's just put all of the data on it. And it's giving them the names, but some of these are buses. So we'll go to the data port tab. And for example, these first seven, I'll create a new bus. And this will be the RX data bus. Um, these next are going to be the TX data bus. And um, these 18 through 41 should be the, oops, maybe this, did this give it the wrong name? So I think it, uh, if you go back to the trigger ports, it may have given something here the wrong name. Um, counter. It's fine. So that should be fine. Um, okay, there we go. So 18 through 41 is the counter. Counter. All right. So we can just hit trigger to see if things are working. Um, so we expect the counter to count up the whole time. TXD and RXD are one, which is as expected. And um, we have this extra floating bit that didn't get into one of the buses. So if we look at, uh, that's fine, TX data. Ah, uh, so we can see that the TX data bus um, is actually missing one. That's where that came from. So if you need to get rid of them, just remove from bus, um, and then we'll add it all back to the bus. There we go. So you could have also just added the extra one to the bus, but this way it added them all back. Um, so you can see that there's eight bits on this, so that's as expected. So for example, I could pull up the, the data and let me send like a T or something, and then re-trigger it manually. And what I see is that the RX data um, is actually 0A, which is a line feed. So if you wanted to see that T, you would have to turn off the line feeds. So let me just send a T again, trigger, and we'll switch this to ASCII, and we can see it's T. So that's as expected. Um, so that's pretty straightforward so far, but it's not giving us anything too useful. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna play around with the 
match units a bit and the trigger condition. So we want to trigger on our own. Um, so we're going to look at this first port here and we're going to say match when we have a one on the uppermost bit, which is new data is available and we don't care what the data is. Um, and we can give that a name if you want, you know, but we can just leave this trigger port zero. It's up to you. Somewhere here is rename. Um, and the trigger itself, you can select between, you know, which of the, the match units cause the trigger. So for example, the most basic is just match unit zero causes it. Um, if you want, you could say, you know, match unit zero and match unit one. I'm going to stick with match unit zero because all I want is when ready high. So when the ready pin goes high, it triggers. We can look at that first. Um, so the board is just going to wait until I send it new data. So if I send it a B, then you can see the RX ready was high and it triggers. You may want to pre-trigger a bit. So for example, I can hit 120 here, which will tell us what was happening um, a little before that ready pin went high. So if I send it A, B together, um, what you'll notice is that the trigger condition, zoom in here, is... Um, is only here when the, the data is ready. Unfortunately, because this is running at 100 megahertz, you don't see any of that previous data, even though we, uh, we have a bit of pre-trigger and we'll deal with that next. So the easiest way to, to do this would be to use windowing. So windowing splits the trigger buffer into a whole bunch of smaller windows. So I could say 16 windows, each window of depth 64, I can make those even smaller, say. Say, let's do 64 windows of depth 16 and the pre-trigger is, you know, uh, let's say four cycles. Um, it'll get four cycles before the pre-trigger. So this will make more sense if I just hit start here. Um, let's send some data. So if I say hello. So if I send hello, you notice that it has a few samples. Um, so it's up to window six because it's captured those six and then it's waiting. So hello world, how are you? There's no new lines here. Um, so it's almost full. We're at window 25. We had 64 windows. So it's going to wait until this is completely done. So I can just send a longer string here. Um, there we go. So what it's done is it split our buffer into a number of smaller buffers. And we can now actually capture a whole bunch of um, events. So each event is captured at the full speed. But we see this, hello world, how are you? Um, if you remember, we set up a counter. So the counter can be used to uh, figure out when each event occurred. You have to make sure your counter doesn't overflow. In this case, for example, I had a 24-bit counter, um, which will overflow pretty quickly at 100 megahertz. So we can see, for example, the counter here. Let me just move this so you can see it. Um, the counter here is... Oops, and we want to unsign decimal, say, place X cursor so we can look at the difference between the X and the O cursor, which is telling us the time between these two data ready. Um, so this is in clock cycles, remember? What we might want is to change this to, um, if I change the radix here, what I'm actually going to say is I want to multiply this times one divided by a hundreds or a hundred megahertz. So we give you this um, and let's switch this to scientific. Oops, so I was hoping it would give it to us in um, So I guess you can't enter the E notation, but we can do that. Um, so there we go. And we also need to adjust the precision here because it was natively just trying to um, chop off all of the, the lower digits. So if you wanted this, for example, it, this is in seconds. Um, you may want it in milliseconds. So we can obviously just 
not we could put in oops cut off three zeros and I'll just put that uh, so now this is trying to give it to us in something like milliseconds as you can see the um, this sort of notation is a pretty quick way to figure out uh, when data is happening using the counter so let's replace our X and O cursors and so this is telling us for example that if you subtract the two there's you know about about one millisecond difference um, between these two points occurring so this is telling us relative to each other uh, when they occurred remember that even though the sampling's at 100 megahertz you normally wouldn't be able to resolve that one millisecond difference you can use this windowing to do that so what's kind of more interesting is to keep going and actually use a feature called storage qualification so i'm going to set up the um, device to only take a sample when this condition is matched here. So the lower bits of the counter are 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Um, what this is going to do is give us a way to reduce the frequency of data capture. So I'll set the window back to 1 and the full depth here. Um, and I'll put a bit of pre-trigger gain. But I'm also going to enable this storage qualification feature. So I just click there. Um, and rather than all data, we're going to turn on match to match zero and match two, and we'll do that as an or. Um, so this is gonna say when the ready flag is high or when the counter is equal to one, 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 one. So this is sort of giving you whenever the counter overflows a certain amount. Um, so if I do this again, I hit capture, and hello world, how are you? Sample buffer full. So we get the same hello world, how are you, oops, as before. Um, let's fit all. So that doesn't seem any more interesting, but the really cool thing is that now this, um, this RxD line is actually going at the correct rate. So we can actually see the bus transitions. We couldn't see that before because after the ready flag was high, it was capturing at 100 megahertz. Now it's defaulting to capturing at a much lower rate um, whenever this, this condition is true based on the counter, um, but it's uh, also capturing that single bit, this single 100 megahertz cycle when the ready flag is high. So you couldn't do this if you just fed it a slower clock because you would miss that uh, that point. So using careful with careful use of the uh, match conditions, you can actually get to the point that you can capture really slow data with really fast data um, in your digital system. So that makes the FPGA design a lot easier. And again, because of this counter, I've set it up to display in milliseconds. So again, I just sort of said, well, it's running at 100, uh, 100 megahertz. I know what each tick of the counter is. And then I you know, put in a smaller number um, to get this in milliseconds. Again, you can't put in that E notation, so you have to put in like 0 0.0001. Uh, so this is great because now when you move this along, it's actually telling you in milliseconds where each sample occurred, which is one of the advantages of that free running counter. Um, you can see it overflows at some point here, so you may want to use a longer. This was just a 24-bit counter. You could use a longer counter if you want. But that's the basic idea of using the ChipScope Pro with both storage qualification and windowing. Um, so that's, again, part one was the setup of this. Part two showed you how this all worked. And I'm hoping to have a part three also showing you with the new Vivido tools and with the Z board.